Hello everyone and welcome to Tubules Live tonight. My name is Jazz and I'll be your host. Today we're very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Ken Hemmings. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Today um, Ken's going to be talking about a couple of restorative cases. Before we dive in though, we'd like to learn a little bit uh, more about you, Dr. Hemmings. Um, so, you're a consultant in restorative at the Eastman Dental Hospital. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about what other clinical activities you do and also your clinical interests? Sure. Um, well, my, I share my time now between uh, practice and the hospital. I was full-time at the hospital, sharing my work between the periodontology department and what was conservative dentistry. But now that's amalgamated in prosthetic dentistry, we're now a department of prosthodontics. And uh, I spend two days a week at the hospital, uh, mainly teaching and some supervision of projects. And the rest of the time is now spent in a practice near home, which is a specialist referral practice. Okay. And, oh, interests. Well, in the hospital, I've always had interest in, um, well, prosthodontics, obviously, but how it interfaces with the other specialties, which could be restorative ones, uh, perio, endo, uh, but also colleagues elsewhere in orthodontics and oral surgery. And a lot of my work's involved in joint clinics. Um, particular one I go to regularly is a hyperdontia clinic. Um, and that's probably where most of the patients that I end up treating uh, or supervised treatment uh, come from. It's a real mix, isn't it, in terms of your working week, I suppose, in that way? Yeah, yeah, no, it's good. I quite like the balance now. I think I've probably got it right. I don't want to uh, change it too much now. Grand. Well, uh, two of the cases that we will be talking about today, it's going to be like a restorative uh, talk show, if, if, you, if you like, you've got two of the cases on. So if you can dive into one of the cases, and what we'll do is we can check out the photos first, so that the viewers at home have a look at the photos as well, uh, and then we can get a brief synopsis about the case. So, Ken, can you describe um, the case that we've got behind us at the moment? Yeah, yeah. It's quite amusing how this has turned into a whole case discussion, because originally I just wanted to show a couple of clinical procedures, which I hadn't seen... Um, filmed or um, discussed really uh, and in uh, the dental literature or videos but uh, so this was one case um, it's a lady who was in her uh, early 50s and had few complaints except she noticed a little bit of roughness uh, on the inner aspect or palatal aspect of the upper right three and um, uh, there's not a lot to see but if perhaps we look at the palatal view perhaps you can highlight that jazz sure. you just see just it's almost like a classic pink spot from external resorption. Um, so when you see that, it's just turned up on the platelet aspect of this particular tooth, uh, you'd probably expect the worst, because often it's a late presentation, patients have no symptoms from it until something breaks through like it has here. And, uh, and, and at this point, the, this, this lady was still asymptomatic when, yeah. uh, when she presented, okay. No, the only thing was the roughness that she felt, okay. no pain. Uh, and again, that's fairly classical. Sometimes it can be so severe, the patient arrives with the tooth in the hand because it's just fractured off horizontally. Uh, so that's, again, not uncommon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose one of the, the adjuncts to, to treatment planning was taking a periapical radiograph, which we, yep. which we have, um, occlusal as well, lower. So that, that's the, is this when it was referred to you? In the, this was the... That yeah. was appropriate, yeah. Yeah, I mean, she'd actually sort of come via um, one of local endodontists uh, who felt that this lesion was actually too extensive to sensibly treat. And I think that decision comes about from really the amount of tooth structure that remains. Now that you can see here that quite a lot of uh, damage has, has occurred. Uh, an interesting point here is that you know, often we associate this uh, lesion with um, trauma. Uh, there's no history of trauma here. Often it's so many years ago, people don't uh, recall it. Um, but it's probably reasonable to have a very close look around the rest of the mouth. And I would probably take an OPT radiograph just to screen that it's not a generalized problem, which is particularly rare, but it's probably some reassurance that it's not gonna happen to other teeth for patients in this case. So, so in this case, did you take a... a yes, we did. Okay, yeah. and it was just, just and isolated? It was just one tooth. Okay, and uh, if I was to have a patient such as this and take a radiograph, and this turned up on my desk, one, I mean, one of my differentials would also be external resorption. As people uh, want to differentiate between internal and external, so can you perhaps uh, just briefly talk about uh, the diagnosis uh, and what the giveaways are in terms of which one it is, and then the management? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, you can see on this radiograph, it's quite a diffuse area of destruction of the tooth, um, and. In other cases, it might be a lot clearer to 
to actually see the root canal intact right through the middle of the tooth. Here it's not so clear because it's quite advanced, uh, but that's probably the main differentiating fact. Um, if you catch these lesions earlier, particularly internal resorption, it becomes very clearly delineated. Mm -hmm. It's like an hourglass expansion of the root canal system, uh, and uh, it's, it's you know, clear that it must be from the inside of the tooth. But here you can't really tell whether it's started internal or external yeah. because it's so um, severe. And it, you know, with internal absorption, if you catch it early enough, then it would presumably halt with the su successful endodontic treatment. Well, it's it, it's one of these rare conditions where we haven't got long, large case uh, numbers in case studies to say if we treat it early, we'll definitely be successful. I think the prognosis it becomes relatively poor because it's a late presentation usually. But assuming the root canal system is intact, uh, first line treatment is probably to do an external repair first, uh, which uh, would mean um, raising a flap, debriding out the uh, diseased tissue and uh, providing a coronal seal. Um, if you've left the root canal system intact, you probably, fingers crossed, leave it alone. But um, if it's exposed during the treatment, you're probably obliged to start a root canal treatment as well. Um, when I've actually done this, and I don't actually do so much of it because I'll probably refer to an endodontist now do a better mm -hmm. job than I would, um, but it, you may have to start the treatment, uh, uh, conventional orthograde endodontic treatment as well at the same time. And if you've done the external repair, obviously the, the conventional root canal treatment has got a better chance of working. Sometimes if uh, it gets extended